Coming up on today's show, meet Muscle Car's budget-friendly new project. Visit Tommy's personal junkyard to pick out an engine, then see how it breaks down. Plus, Rick shows you how easy it is to replace your own U-joints. You may be wondering, am I watching Muscle Car? Am I watching an old episode of Kojak? Well, believe it or not, this is our newest project, 1973 Buick Century. If you're wondering why this thing deserves to be in the muscle car shop, look at it this way. It's V8, it's mid-size, it's rear-wheel drive, and it's got some cool lines to it. This thing's got a lot of potential, plus it was stupid cheap. When it came time to choose our latest victim, we listened to the viewers. and You guys told us you want to see a project that a working family can afford, can be done in an average gearhead's garage, and isn't going to take a bunch of years to complete. So we took those guidelines, laid down a budget of 10 grand, and went shopping for a car. When we brought this fine piece of Detroit steel back to the shop, the haters came out of the woodwork. But that's okay, because we have a vision and it's gonna live up to the name Muscle Car as Project Blue Collar Buick. By 1973, car manufacturers were being choked to death by the EPA and body lines were looking kinda of bloated, but there were still a few bright spots in GM's lineup. This Buick has crisp body lines and could be ordered with a factory big block. It's not hard to look past that 70s funk to see that with the right paint scheme, wheels, stance, and a few other appearance tweaks, this could be a head-turning street bruiser. But we're not gonna stop there. It's not really a muscle car if it doesn't have what matters under the hood. We're gonna swap out that small block Chevrolet for a big block 455 Buick. But all that additional power means we need to upgrade the brakes. Now you don't have to spend a bunch of money here. Just upgraded stock style discs will give you plenty of stopping power. Throw in some additional low butt suspension tricks and this is gonna be one bad Buick. The interior definitely needs some attention. That bench seat has got to go, so we'll swap it out for some buckets and console out of something to make it look a lot better. The back seat just needs to be dyed or just recovered. The door panels, they're in pretty good shape, just need a splash of color. Yeah, before we tackle any of that, we got to go find a motor, man. You don't know where there's a lonely little 455 looking for a home, do you? Mm, not really. Probably about six of them. <laughs> Let's hit the highway. Cool. Well, Rick, this is my little stash, which I call Big Body Ridge. This is a little stash, huh? Yeah, well, it's big cars <laughs> and a little stash. I've got a couple of the 455s. I think I may have something that we can work with. Cool. Well, you got anything that maybe not just low miles, but something that just runs halfway decent we can freshen up? Yeah, I've probably got some. Cool. Hey, man, what about this one owner cream puff? Well, you know how it is. Um, this one was drove back and forth to church. I thought you were going to say it was driven in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This one's actually a 350. Not really a 455 like we were looking for. Mm -hmm. Plus, I don't know nothing about this one. All right, keep looking. Yeah. Let's check out this old Rivy, Rick. This one run? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we ain't gonna be starting this one. Well, we could. I just have to find the carburetor. Uh, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if every car around here doesn't have a carburetor on it, now you can still check them out, still do a compression test on it. If you can get the thing spinning over, you can verify that it spins. It's got right. compression, throw a gauge on it. You can even check oil pressure. Yeah, good thing is it's complete. It's got everything except for the carburetor. Yeah. So some of those brackets and stuff is pretty hard to find. But you know, we just did a special on the Quadrajets now, so the price is going up. Uh-oh. <laughs> you got something maybe we can fire up and listen to? Yeah, let's check this other review out. This one got a carb on it. Hey, our luck is turning around. Does it run? Um, I don't know. Do you have keys for it? Let's see. <laughs> no, keys aren't in it. <laughs> All right. Let's, oh. check, let's check the oil out. Oil's good and black. Maybe a candidate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's hot wire it then. After the break, find out if this old piece of iron has some life left in it. This is turned it over now. We basically brought with us the same tools we took when we went to go look for a car body. We also brought along a battery, a jumper box, just in case we kill the battery, a compression tester, and a gas can. There's a few easy things you can check to see if it's worth spending your time on to get it started, like the oil. 
If it's clean, great. If it's black, that's okay. You don't want anything that looks like chocolate milk, because that could mean it's got a cracked head or a blown head gasket, which is repairable, but it's hard to repair a cracked block. Now, another easy thing to check while you're under the hood is the coolant. Just make sure that it has some, it doesn't look like mud, and there's no oil in it. Now, this looks pretty nice and clean and green, so we're good to go. Another easy thing to do is to read the plugs. This one looks like it was running a little bit rich, but that's okay. You don't want any heavy carbon buildup or a greasy film, which can indicate a dead cylinder. One more thing, which is a little more labor intensive, is a compression test. If you were planning on buying this engine and dropping it right in, this would be a must. Our plan is to rebuild it, but you know, hey, it never hurts to have more information. I'm using a remote starter switch from Matco. Super easy to use. Just clip one end to your positive, clip the other end onto the wire that's leading down to your starter solenoid. You ready to hit this thing? Sure, let's give it a shot. Uh, nothing. Whoa, dude, we got sparks down here. Uh-oh. Yep. Oh. I don't know, we got a problem with the starter. I'll grab a jack. All right. Well, I think I found the problem. The solenoids. Well, you could say, seen this better day. Guess we'll find one on one of these other wrecks and see what we can get. We got the starter swapped out and went ahead and stuck a longer lead on here so I don't have to use the button. Let's see what we got. You ready? Give it a shot. At least it's turned it over now. Where we at? Not good, not bad. We got about 75 pounds, so let's put some gas in it and see if it's due to fire. Cool. Now, while we were doing the compression test, we disconnected the hot lead off the HEI. That way, there was no way that this thing was going to fire up while we're spinning it over. But now we want to try to start it, so we built up a little lead just to jump it from the ignition over to the battery. To see if there's any life left in this thing. We've already removed and plugged the factory fuel lines to keep it from pulling up any bad gas. Our way around that is to fill the carburetor bowl through this port, which will give us about 30 seconds of run time. Go ahead, man. Okay. Ignition's hot. You ready? Oh, yep. That doesn't sound too bad. I don't hear any rods trying to swap cylinders. You're right, and it's not really smoking that bad for it setting as long as it has. Yeah, not bad at all. I'd say we got a pretty good candidate here. Good deal. You gonna pull it? No, you're gonna pull it. We can get back to the shop a lot faster if we both work on it. Come on, <laughs> let's pull it. We'll, we'll pull it. Get good deal. <laughs> Up next, Rick and Tommy crack open the 455 to see what's lurking inside. Well, we got the engine pulled and back to the shop. Now it's time to tear this thing apart and see if we picked a good one. Now, if you got it out of a wrecking yard, then they probably pulled it for you. But if you get it from a private seller, you can probably pull it yourself and save a few bucks. As for price, well, I'm going to donate it to the project, but normally these 455 Buicks usually sell about 200 to three and a half for a good buildable core. So we're going to figure in about 250 to our budget. We got our engine up on a stand, and now it's time to start knocking this dude apart. If you're planning on bringing it into a machine shop, leave the long block together, because most shops prefer to have the rotating assembly and the valve train together when you bring it in. To save a few dimes, our plan is to only fix what's wrong and add a few small minor upgrades. So we're going to go ahead and tear this thing down completely. If you're planning on reusing these parts, then make sure to keep track of what bolts go where. They are size specific and you don't want to get into a guessing game on reassembly. After 30 plus years of heat cycles, it's no surprise the water pump bolts don't want to come loose. But that's why we have drills. The Buicks are notorious for cracked exhaust manifolds and broken exhaust manifold studs. So you can spend a little bit of time with a torch and save yourself a whole lot of time down the road. The metal expands when it's heated, so the trick here is to heat the metal around the threads so it expands away from the bolt. Got it. Nope, just snapped off. And sometimes even with a torch and everything, they still break off. That's where they make easy outs.
Now, if you're reusing as many parts as we are, then be sure to keep track of all those small pieces and hardware. And if you're worried at all about putting this mess back together, then snap some pictures of it before you take it apart. It can save you a big headache down the road. Time to start cleaning this stuff up. Buying an engine like this, there's no way to know its true history. But there are a few clues to let you in on some of it if you know what to look for. This intake's been sealed with red silicone. We know this isn't factory, so this intake's been off at some point in time. The timing chain's got some slack in it, so it's probably got a bunch of miles on it. Why does this matter? Well, if this engine's been re-ringed a few times or got excessive miles, you're going to be spending some money at the machine shop. Rick, check this thing out. Man, it's crazy clean. Wow, yeah, it is. It's a good sign, man. Maybe the bill at the machine shop will be a little less. Let's hope so. Our plan was to replace the push rods anyhow, but you can see somebody was a little bit of a throttle junkie and been a few of them. So these will have to be replaced. Organization is important when removing internal parts you do want to reuse. Every piece, push rods, lifters, pistons, caps, and everything in between needs to be matched back to the cylinder they came from. Now you know we said an engine will give you clues as to how many miles are on it. Well, one of those clues is the lifters. Now brand new lifters will actually have a dome surface on them. And you can see that by putting the face of the lifter up against the side of another lifter and look for the light. Now the lifters out of our engine are either flat or just slightly concave, as you can tell by putting them through the same test. Now generally speaking, the more of a concave the lifters have, the higher mileage the engine is. Hey, Greasy, come check these bearings out. Man, this thing looks like it was run out of oil. We got a trip to machine shop mm. for sure. Yeah, it looks like a good luck ran out, huh? Oh, no sweat. I'll give the machinist a call and give him a heads up. Shoot. Coming up, a quick and easy fixer-upper tip that could save you a tow truck bill. Hey guys, welcome back. You know, Buick engines aren't known for the horsepower as much as they're known for their stump pulling torque. And one little often overlooked part that helps transfer all that power to the rear end is a U-joint. Now a lot of guys don't really understand them and they don't realize how easy they are to replace. Now whether you've got a 200 or 2000 horsepower vehicle, all that power has to go through this. Now, if you got your drive shaft out anyway, inspect it. And if you have any doubts at all, replace it. Even these heavy duty joints only run 20 bucks a pop and standard duty joints are even cheaper. That's pretty good insurance against a tow bill later on. 
build on a budget. Muscle car projects that save you time and money. Now this one's out of a big rig. It's pretty much the same as from a car, just bigger and easier for you to see on camera. The inside of each of the four caps is lined with needle bearings, which allow the cap to rotate on the joint. And when the caps are placed on the yokes, they allow the drive shaft to follow the movement of the suspension and still rotate without binding. First things to go are the retainer clips. New clips come with the U-joint, so you just pry these out however you can. Next, you need to force the old bearing cups out of the drive shaft. A piece of pipe or an old socket can support the shaft. Then just whack it with a hammer and drift until the cups can be removed. After a quick cleanup, remove the new bearing caps, place the U-joint in its spot, then slide on the bearings. Screw in the Zerk fitting. Now if your U-joints don't look exactly like these, then you probably have this style, and these can be popped out with an old pair of pliers. Now, if you're planning on not using your drive shaft for a while, make sure to wrap the end up with some tape. This will keep the caps in place and help protect those delicate little needle bearings. Now all it cost us was 40 bucks and a little bit of time to replace his U-joints. Add in the 250 that we spent on our core motor and the 1500 that we paid for the car, and we've burned through 1790 out of our $10,000 budget. But we're not going to be spending any more money here today because we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here. Today on Muscle Car, we're flipping our lids. Project Blue Collar Buick gets its top chopped and its channel hacked, and a glimpse at a top secret project. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. It's time to start ripping into Project Blue Collar Buick. We're gonna tackle the panel that needs the most work first, the roof. A previous owner probably had good intentions when they try to fix this massive rust hole in the roof, but good intentions really don't cut it when it comes to restoring a car, and neither did the fiberglass, plastic filler, and duct tape they used. Now we're not just going to skin this one. For one thing, nobody makes a roof skin for a 1973 Buick, and even if they did, the rust on this goes way too deep, so we're going to be replacing the entire roof. We just need to expose the pillar, so we're only pulling the trim we need to for now. And this homemade tool here works pretty good. It doesn't work that good when the molding is glued into place. <laughs> this is awesome. Judging by the three layers of different types of sealant, I'd say this car's been messed with a few times before. Now this bench seat is definitely not going back in. <laughs> I hate bench seats. They suck and they're ugly. Stupid bench seat. <laughs> and it's not going to go back in the car. <laughs> the windshield isn't cracked, so we're hanging on to it, it for now. If our budget allows, we might replace it later. The back glass is going in the keeper pile, too. Our Buick's all stripped out and ready to get decapitated, but what are we going to replace that roof with? Well, that brings us to today's special guest, 1975 Pontiac Le Mans. It may not look pretty, but it's got the same roof as our 73 Buick, and it's plenty solid enough, it's something we can work with. Now, a little research and a couple of phone calls, and you should be able to track down a roof for just about any vehicle. Now, the cheapest route is going to be a self-service wrecking yard, so if you chop it off yourself, the price goes down. Now, if you want the yard to slice it off for you, just be real clear where you need this thing cut. We gave 150 bucks for the roof. We borrowed the whole car to show you guys how it's done. But the rest of it goes back to the parts guy we got it from. Now, before we break out that saw, we got to take some measurements, because pretty soon here, we're going to have two cars sitting around with the tops cut off. And at that point, it's pretty hard to reference how long these posts are supposed to be. So step one is measure the height of the roof. I've measured the damage on the Buick to see how much roof we need. I'll transfer those measurements to the Le Mans and add a little so we have some metal to work with. Now 
After triple checking our measurements and marks, it's time to break out the saws and have at it. Now try to keep your cuts at an angle that can be easily duplicated, because you're going to have to copy them on the other car. Guess it's a drop top. <laughs> That's convertible. We marked the Buick earlier when we took the measurement, so it's ready to have its top chop. Stick around, when we come back, we'll be flipping our lids. After the break, the Buick comes back together. Or does it? Yeah, it don't fit. Hey, welcome back. Well, it's a little late to turn back now. We got two cars with the tops cut off. Like I said earlier, we trimmed our top a little long, so it's going to be riding a little high. But now it's just a matter of trimming this dude to fit and welding it on. Yeah, it don't fit. If you plan on keeping the dash, and we do, you better throw a welding blanket over it, or a new dash might chew up a chunk of your budget. Now don't go crazy here, just take a little bit at a time. It's a whole lot easier to take it off than it is to put it back on. Now you can see after I trimmed the front pillar a little bit, we're still way out of alignment here. You can tell by this, this whole roof still needs to come forward. That means we've still got to cut some more out of the front. Oh, now that's getting better. Now you can see here where the lines are coming together pretty nice on this post here, but on the back you can see where it's still stepped up quite a bit. Now that tells me that the next step is going to be trimming this one off. Now I need a measurement of 26 inches here, and we're already at 26, so I can't lose any more length out of this. But as you can see, it's still sitting a little bit high. Well, what's holding this up is a little bit of metal along that edge. Well, if I trim that off, it's going to allow that to drop in, let this whole top relax, we'll be ready to weld it. Our 26 inches right there. Perfect. Consider it trimmed and fit. When welding on the top, we're going to use a procedure called sleeving. Since we're using butt welds, all the pillars need to be reinforced to make them as strong as they were from the factory. So we're adding these small plates to all the weld joints. The sleeves are going on the inside of the post. They'll actually end up stronger than they were from the factory. Small squares of sheet metal will form the sleeves, and some plug welds will hold them in place. A punch will keep the drill from wandering and make sure the holes are right where you want them. Once the first sleeve is welded up, a second one goes on for extra strength. We're hoping by placing the rear sleeves in the roof section, it should be easier to drop in. But when you're designing on the fly, you've got to expect some challenges. Front first, front first. This ain't gonna work. No, let's try just dropping it in the back first. So if you drop it in the back, let this slide in, cut these off shorter, I'll bet we can get this to pop over the top of it. Just make sure this will drop in. We may have to bend this in a little bit. We can use a zip screw so to pull it back out tight. When you do that, you're going to bend that, that post out. No, that's just a wrap around. That's all it is. It ain't plug weld too there. All right. It's your bowl. I'm just holding, holding the horns. He's just holding the horns. No, it's just cut that off really short. It's still not going to work because it has to be dropped in pretty much from where we're at right now. I think either we need to use this one and cut one of them off or cut one of them off and use it. Okay, what we finally came up with for our issue with the front plates is actually pretty simple. We trimmed off the excess, made a relief cut, and bent the tabs flush with the top of the post, allowing the roof to fall into place. Then using some pry tools, we bent the tabs back up so we can weld them in. So now, all we're ready to do is measure this guy out and then burn it in. This is where all that careful measuring we did earlier pays off. 14. We're good. We want a slight gap between the two panels here, so the weld goes all the way through to the sleeves. It doesn't get much stronger than that.
hot. It's like me, smoking. <laughs> Once all six pillars are welded solid, we'll grind them off and prep them for body work. Now I know replacing an entire roof can be pretty intimidating, but hey, that's why you learn on a $1,500 car, not a $15,000 car. With a low buck project like this, you can afford to take a few chances. The worst thing you end up doing is costing yourself a little extra time. So don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself. Hey guys, welcome back. Now we won the first battle, but the war on rust is still raging. And the next battlefield is this rear window channel. Now if you don't fix this correctly, water's gonna leak through there, get in your trunk and cause more rust. So don't be tempted, to take any shortcuts. The first thing I need to do is get the rest of the window sealer out of the way. A little trick is to heat up the end of a pry tool and melt it out. All the clips need to go. Then I can attack it with a wire brush to get all the rust and junk out of the way so I can see how bad it really is. If this was a small area, I'd just freehand it, but a patch this large calls for a template. I'll make it a little larger than needed so I have some wiggle room later. And once the template's cut out and transferred to a chunk of steel, it's onto the bandsaw. Now this shape could easily be cut out with a pair of tin snips or an air saw. To make the second side of the channel, I've taken a flat piece of steel, formed it to the first piece, now I'm taking it together. Now it's time to take out the garbage, or chop it out in this case. After a little trimming, the patch falls right into place. A few tacks, and we can move on to the rest of the channel. Okay, there's still one more little spot here that needs to be patched in, but what I'm trying to show you is that you can do this repair using nothing more than a pair of tin snips and a basic welder. Now I'm gonna move on to the back here and show you another way to do a patch using a brake and a shear. Now you could also use tin snips, a hammer, and a vise for this method, but I'll tell you what, a shear and a break sure are nice. I made this piece way longer than I need here, but the rest of it will be used in other places. Now a shrinker stretcher does exactly what the name implies. It either stretches it, or in this case, shrinks it. Now this is going to help you get the radius that you need to match the original contour of this window channel whole lot easier to weld in that way. Hey, I got a whole lot more holes to patch in this thing, but for this week, we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here. Hey guys, you know, a lot of cool stuff happens around here when the cameras aren't rolling. Now, me and Tommy, we've been messing around with a project hidden out here in the warehouse for the last couple of days. Figured you might dig on scene what a couple of sick, twisted gearheads do for fun. I right, got the show closed out, man. We got brakes yet? Yeah, we got front brakes, so that ought to stop us sometime. Yeah, front brakes is fine. Yeah, I think this is going to be a pretty good investment of time for the, you know, head turner that we're making. Yeah, pretty good considering this is the car we use for parts. Yeah, let's sneak this dude out of here and take it for a test ride. Sweet. We like to call it Project Dead Goat. Now, she may be a little rough around the edges, but at least she ain't pretty. Is it street legal? Hell no. Is it fun? Hell yeah. We gotta go get him! Woo! Get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, go on! <laughs> No way we can crush this thing. It's way too much fun. I hope that parts guy let me donate him a hundred bucks for it. We'll just have to see what we can do. See guys, just goes to show you, you don't have to have deep pockets to have fun with cars. All you need is a little imagination, an old parts car. That's it. See y'all.
Today on Muscle Car, it's time for some cutting and welding. Tommy gives the Buick bumpers some nip tuck. Then Rick gets a handle on things. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. Today we're back on Blue Collar Buick where we're going to do some custom body mods that won't cost you much more than your time. The Buick is a low buck project, so we've got to get creative when it comes to jazzing it up. So it's time to break out the grinders and welders. After picking up our 73 Century from a salvage yard, we replaced the roof and fixed some rust blocks. Once the Buick 455 came back from the machine shop, I assembled it while Rick put a shift kit in the Turbo 350. With the drivetrain well on its way, we can turn our attention to appearance. Part of the problem with mid-70s cars were changes brought on by new government safety regulations. And big ugly bumpers are one example of this. Now prior to the urethane bumpers coming out in the late 70s, these monstrosities were the norm. And they're not cool at all. But we're going to fix that by shaving it, narrowing it, and tucking it tighter to the body for a cleaner, more modern look. But before we do anything, we'll knock those rusty nuts loose and get the specimen up on the table. Now we figure tucking the bumper in a total of four inches is going to give us the look that we're after. Now four inches may seem like a lot until you start looking at how this bumper is actually mounted. Because we can achieve two inches right there just by drilling a hole in the bottom of that shock, collapsing it back, and re-welding it. An additional two inches can easily be had right in here just by chopping out some of these guts, taking this mounting plate, re-welding it to the back, hanging our bumper back on it. No problem. We're reusing bits and pieces of this assembly, so I gotta be careful taking it all apart. When drilling through the shock, wear eye protection because they are pressurized <laughs> with really smelly gas. This is gonna get welded later, so I'm gonna clean it up now while it's still easy to get to. With the pressure released out of the shocks, the plasma makes short work of the brackets. Next comes the bumper side of the brackets. By chopping the excess off of these, we're moving that bumper back over an inch and a half in one swipe. After cleaning the slag off both sides with the grinder, I can line the brackets back up, tack them in, and then we'll set the bumper back in place to see how many problems we've created. Uh, we got problems, dude. It's hitting, ain't it? Yep, it's hitting right. Here, set it down for a second. That's hitting these brackets right here, dude. I can chop them off. You want me to cut it? No, I can cut it. I won't cut it. Why? I've been cutting everything else. Okay, you cut it. Hey guys, welcome back. Got all that metal chopped out of the way and the bumper should slide right on. We'll give it a shot anyway. Cool, looks good. Let's drop it, check it out. Well, it does look a whole lot better, but dude, these have gotta go. Man, that's no lie. And this rubber impact strip's gotta go too. Yeah, I know there's bolts behind there to hold this whole mess together, but we can shave those. That's not too big of a deal. And while we're at it, we can shorten the side of the bumper up and move it in some. That'll help a bunch. Yeah, it works for me. Let's snatch this dude off of here and chop it up. Good deal. After pulling off the trim, we realized these mounting bolts also hold the bumper to the inner structure. No big deal. I'll clean them and plug weld them back up so we don't lose any strength. Man, we've been wanting to get rid of these bumperettes since the first time we saw this car. And good riddance. A few licks of the grinder and my welds are clean. We're ready for more chopping. If you're planning on having your bumpers re-chrome, take a piece of advice from our friends over at Advanced Plating. Don't grind down your own welds. Let them do it. It'll save you some work and save you some money in the long run. But for budget reasons, we're going to paint ours, so it's no big deal. Rick's got the bumper looking a whole lot better, but by no means are we done. We still got to trim three quarters of an inch off both ends to tighten up the gap. That may not seem like a whole lot, but it's the little details like that that add up to make a big attitude change. I want to tuck in each end three quarters of an inch, so I'm using, you guessed it, three quarter inch masking tape as a guide. 
Using a combination of different width tape, you can easily measure out consistent sections of whatever it is you're hacking on. I've swapped from the cutting disc to a flap wheel to bevel the edges for better weld penetration. Well, that brought it in three quarters of an inch, but we still want to clip its wings and also shorten up the side about four inches, but that requires a little more cutting. I'm reusing the back part of this piece, but I'll get the excess first. This is part of the piece I just cut off, trimmed to fit. I'm filling in the gap with some eighth inch plate I already shaped. Next comes the big piece. Over four inches is coming out of here. Just like before, I'm capping it with a piece I just cut off the end. Now that's a real change. This is a big chunk of metal that I cut out of there, but anything less just wouldn't have got the job done. The front end is definitely looking a lot better but the car still got some areas that could use some improvement. So while I finish up the front bumper, Rick's gonna show you what we've got planned for the doors. Now, when you look down the length of the car, what do you see? Well, I see some pretty stylish body lines and some pretty dated door handles. Now, GM used the same ones through the 70s and most of the 80s, so they're pretty much a dime a dozen. A blue collar, well, this thing's gotta stand out from a crowd, so those have got to go. Now you'd think that we would just shave them off and be done with it, but for you guys that have had shaved door handles before, you already know what a pain they can be. Besides, you're going to be in at a good 200 bucks or more for solenoids and the hardware to get them to work. So we're just going to swap ours out for a little more aesthetically pleasing ones. And thanks to a trip to a self-service wrecking yard, these ran us less than 50 bucks. The first step is to strip both sets of handles. I didn't get keys with the new handles, but on the bright side, the lock cylinders are cheap and easy to replace. Now with that out of the way, we can set the new piece in. I cut that out so that these tabs here can drop into place because you have to be real careful where your edges are to make sure they're not going to interfere with anything on the back of the door, namely your jam. Just pay attention to how this thing is clocked on the door. Make sure that it lines up nice with your body lines and also don't forget about any extra holes in there. Make sure you cut your panel out low enough to allow for that to get eliminated. When I cut these out at the wrecking yard, I made sure to give myself plenty of extra sheet metal. It's always better to have too much than to come up short and have to scab something together. Using the new sheet metal as a template, I can scribe out the section of the Buick that needs to go. I'm using a combination of tools to get this job done. Body saw, grinder, cutoff disc, carbide bits, whatever it takes. Just make sure to do plenty of test fitting as you go. Once you're happy with the fit, strip the paint out of the way and weld it in. The handle's in and looking pretty cool, but you still have to get the thing to work. And that's where it's real important when you choose which handles you're going to install in your car. Make sure that the handle that you have, see how this one here has a lever that pushes down, and make sure that's compatible with your latch. Now these latches here have another lever, which needs to go down to get the door open. So it's going to be pretty simple to hook up. I'm starting by putting the original rod into the new handle. Once it's set in place, I'll mark the length that needs to be to engage the original latch. The rod needs a stop to push on the lever, and I've got a low-tech solution. A washer welded in place should do the trick. I'll trim it to my mark and cross my fingers that parts from two cars made over 25 years apart will actually work together. All right, see if it works. 
<laughs> like butter. Now when the locks show up, I can build the linkage and get those working too. Now, I know they look a little bit funky right now, but that's only because they're white. The game plan is to shoot them body color and make them blend right in. By the time blue collar is done, you will hardly even see. Hey guys, welcome back. You know, we got the front and sides looking pretty cool, but the back end will definitely still needs some help. And these tail lights, I think, are the ugliest I've ever seen. So they gotta go. We've given it a lot of thought, and the design we came up with is going to give it some style. But it's going to require removing some metal here and adding some there. The first things to go, the bumperettes. Yeah, we really hate these things. Next to go, this huge hump. Now humps can be good, but this ain't one of them. That hump was hiding a secret. What the heck is all this stuff? I don't know, but it's gonna go in the round file. With that out of the way, I can see what metal needs to be trimmed to match the new profile we have planned for the bumper. Now, from the time we bought this car, we knew that the rear bumper had some fitment issues. Well, now you can see why. This sucker's been rear-rented at some point. Pretty good, that's a lot of movement. Well, when that happened, it bent the rear bumper out of shape. Now, we don't have any fancy pants tools around here to get the sucker pushed back out, so we're gonna do it the same way you guys would do it at home. Take it off, chop it apart, and make it fit. We got the bumper stripped down to just the chrome skin, marked the center, so now we're ready to cut this dude in half. Hey, Tom, you got the brackets on. Let's see where we're at with this thing. All right. How's it look down there? Much better, man. Much better. Much better. I like this line right here. I here on the, nice. Here on the corners, it looks good, too. So. Cool. Let's put a little piece in there and tack it in place. Work on the other side. Yeah. We're welding some temporary brackets in to hold the left side still while we get the right side lined up. It lined up pretty easy, so it's time to tack it all together, pull it off, and fill it in. Cutting off that hump left a pretty mean hole that needs to be filled. I formed some eighth inch plate to do the job. While I was finishing the bumper, Tommy's been extending the trunk lid. Our plan is to give the taillights a whole new outline, and these will give them a much sleeker look. Time for a test fit and a little preview of what the new back end is gonna look like. The changes we made today sure have improved the fit and finish and style of this old car. Not to mention it only cost us about 50 bucks for some door handles, some welding wire, and some cutoff wheels. Now we do still need some lenses to fill in our newly restyled back end, and I have a couple ideas on how to build them, but for this week, we're all out of time. So until next time, we're out of here. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. Red Sled will be leaving and go to the upholstery shop soon, so we've got to get it wired up and the glass installed. I've already started laying out the harness, but old Rick just won't stay away from the Buick. Oh, I'd love to give you a hand on the wiring. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Besides, we got a Buick over here that needs some taillight lenses, so I'm going to build these before I go give Tommy a hand. Last time, Project Blue Collar Buick got its first body mods when we updated the door handles and chopped a ton of steel out of the front bumper. Next, we started giving the back end its new profile. Now we were hoping to straighten out this bent rear panel and start building some taillight lenses, but we got to looking at it and it's bent a little worse than we thought. Add in the rust damage and it's just too far gone. It's going to be faster and easier to just chop it off and build a new one. Besides, we'll have some brand new sheet metal to play with. Step one is to find the edge of the sheet metal that needs to be replaced, which means getting all those years of crud out of the way.
Matco spot weld cutter will take care of the pinch weld, but a drill bit would work here too. Next, I'm marking off a quarter inch inside the factory bend. This will leave a lip to weld the new panel to. The pen mark is just a backup, in case the tape gets pulled off as I'm cutting. After I get the straight cuts with a disc, I'll hit the corners with the air saw, then finish it all off with the air chisel. With the old panel out of the way, I can smooth off the bumps with a flap wheel. All right, we got the old sheet metal chopped out of the way. I got some new pieces here that I'm building. They're pretty basic. It's a flat piece with a 90 degree break. I'm trying to keep this simple, and this will give us some nice fresh sheet metal, and then we can start finally building our taillights. These panels are pretty flat, with the exception of the centerpiece, which is why I had to make it in three sections. The bend along the bottom edge was made with a break, but the rest will have to be hand formed. To prep the new metal for welding, a hole punch is the quickest way to go. Don't have one? No problem, just break out the drill. Cleco fasteners will hold it in place while I tack it. The old tail panel has one last purpose in life, and that's to help me position the new. I want the new openings to be slightly smaller than the originals, so I'm shrinking the top and sides using three quarter inch tape as a guide. I know, an air saw may be slow and noisy, but it's the best way to get the precise cut that I need here. I built these frames here out of half inch square tubing. It's gonna serve three different purposes. One, it gives me a mounting surface for the new lenses. Two, it's gonna space that lens out so it doesn't look as sunk in as the original taillights did. I hated that. And three, it's gonna give me a way to hold my buckets in place. I pre-built the outer frames, but I saved the center one to show you guys how it was done. It's very important to make sure the frame is square as you weld. Check and recheck as you go, or you may end up with a frame that won't fit your panel. Once it's all melted together, time to drill some holes for the mounting studs. Drilling completely through the frame instead of just one side will help the studs mount straight and give a hole on the back side to plug weld into. Before the studs get welded in place, use the frame and a center punch to mark where the mounting holes in the panel will need to go. I made these studs by cutting the heads off some bolts we had laying around the shop. Make sure the studs are slightly recessed to give a pocket for the welds to fill. I'll drill the holes in my pre-marked panel and see how it fits. Here we 
we go. I got my frames looking pretty nice. Now I know replacing that rear panel took us on a little bit of a detour, but we're finally ready to put some lenses on the back end of this thing. Hey, Tommy, want to give me a hand uh, acquiring some materials? Man, I don't like the way that sounds, but I definitely could use a break from wiring up old red sled. What exactly do you have in mind? Uh, trust me. Uh-oh. Coming up, the guys put their sticky fingers to use for a good cause. Sometimes building on a budget, <laughs> that means you have to use all your available resources. No, this is an automotive lens prism, but the price is right and it'll basically do the exact same thing, diffuse the light. Cover it up with some colored plexiglass and you'll end up with a taillight lens in any shape you'd ever want. The frames are a little smaller than the actual lenses are going to be. I did this because it's a lot easier to get the final shape right with a piece of plastic than with a piece of metal. With the overall size marked out, it's time to start cutting the actual lens. Now this stuff breaks really easy, so make sure to support the entire piece. I'm just scribing, not cutting all the way through, so I don't have to worry about damaging the table. Beautiful. A die grinder will tweak it into final shape. With the textured plastic trim to fit, I came back and made duplicates out of flat plexiglass. Now this will be a lot easier to paint, plus it's going to help protect the delicate prism plastic behind it. Now since this is going to be the top layer of our taillights, I'm going to use it to mask the parts off that I don't want to see, namely the frames by painting a black edge all the way around. Using the trunk lid and frames as a guide, I can lay off the shape. And there you have the shape of the new red area in the lens. The rest of it's going to be all black. Before I headed into the booth, I masked off the area that'll be red, leaving the rest exposed and ready for some black base coat. After several coats and 20 minutes of drying time, the tape comes off and I'm ready for the red. I'm coating the entire lens, black and all, with red candy. Now true candy is invisible over black, but if you're using over-reduced opaque red to do this, you're going to need to mask off the black first. Spray as many coats as you need to make them as dark as you want, then follow up with three coats of clear. Once a last coat of clear set up, I use some windshield urethane to glue the two halves of the lenses together and stick them onto the frames. Now these, along with the modifications we did to the trunk lid and the bumper, let's got this thing looking more like a custom and a lot less like Kojak's old ride. Now the center panel is dark now, but trust me, I did not go through all that trouble just to leave it looking like that. But Tommy needs my hand on red sled, so that'll have to wait for another day. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. We got Blue Collar Buick out of the booth with their first coat of primer laid down. And now it's time to get it up on the rack, do some suspension work. Yeah, this thing's come a long way from that underpowered oversized land barge that we started with. After we plucked our budget beauty from the salvage yard, we replaced the roof, found a Buick 455 and rebuilt it with a few upgrades. Installed a shift kit into the Turbo 350, updated the door handles, put the bumpers on a diet, and came up with some rad taillights. 
And when we first picked up our Buick, it actually drove pretty good for a car its age. But after inspecting the suspension, yeah, it definitely needs some bushings. But when we got the thing apart, we're going to replace all the suspension components. And that's because we want a good, solid foundation for future upgrades. It's important to inspect your car suspension, not just to figure out what parts you need, but for safety. If you've got a project that you're tinkering on during the weekend, but driving it during the week, you need to make sure it's safe until you can get around to rebuilding the front end. You can check the ball sockets on your center link and your tie rod ends by gently rocking the steering wheel back and forth. The tie rod looks like it's hanging in there, but the pitman arm is definitely moving more than a center link, so this socket is bad. It might be alright for a little while, but it could get real bad real quick, so if your plan is not to replace it, be sure to keep an eye on it. If you raise the car up, you can check the ball joints too. Just get a nice long pry bar, stick it in between the frame and your spindle, and check for any kind of movement. Ideally, there shouldn't be any play in there at all. If you just have a little bit of movement, then that means that it needs to be replaced. This is a perfect example. But if you have a lot of movement, then that could mean that it's going to blow apart. And that's a bad thing. Another thing that needs to be checked is the idler arm. It can have a little bit of play, but that's a little excessive, so it needs to be replaced. And while you're inspecting your suspension, don't forget to check out your A-arm bushings. If they're cracked and coming apart, especially something this bad, be sure to replace them. Knocking the front end apart is pretty straightforward. Find a nut and remove it. The steering linkage comes off all in one piece. We'll explain why later. That dude hasn't been off in a while. The down and dirty, but safe way to get your springs off if you don't have a spring compressor is to break out the torch. There's a lot of tension in these springs, so the trick is to release that energy a little bit at a time. Once they're relaxed, you can cut them out. I've got the control arms all cleaned up and ready to swap out the bushings. I'm going to be using a hydraulic press because I got so many of them and I don't want to be here all day. Now you could do this with a hammer, but you can save yourself a lot of time and frustration by carrying them to your local alignment shop and having them do it. A press is one of the simplest tools in the shop, but also one of the most dangerous. With 25 tons of pressure on tap, if something goes wrong, it will already be too late. Make sure you have the item properly situated on the base and everything is perfectly aligned. If not, you could have something ricocheting off your nugget before you even realize it. With stubborn bushings, be sure not to distort the AR, or getting the new ones in could be nearly impossible and could even affect your alignment. When pressing the new bushing in, be sure to reinstall the shaft in the right direction. To be safe, it's a good idea to label them before you pull them out. Since Tommy's got the bushing swapped out in these upper A-arms, I'm going to go ahead and take care of the upper ball joints while he does the lower A-arms. They can tell by these rivets, these are still the original ball joints. No big deal. That's what we have grinders for. You can use a grinder, but I'm using a flap wheel for this. Just be sure not to take any chunks out of the A-arm. Ball joints bolt in. That's how I knew the old ones were the originals. Well, they go in a whole lot easier than they come out, that's for sure. Well, I'm going to go ahead and swap out the rest of these ball joints, put some black paint on them, and start putting the front end together on the Buick. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're going to be taking blue color one step closer to the street. 
Coming up, Rick ties up some loose ends and Tommy packs it in. Hey, welcome back. We've got the A-arms and the spindles reinstalled. We've also upgraded to a set of Detroit Eaton lowering springs that are big block specific. And at 160 bucks a set, that's some money well spent because they're going to give our Buick a whole new attitude. Well, now we can go and start assembling our new tie rods. I want the alignment to be as close as possible. That way we can safely drive it down to the alignment shop when our Buick gets back on the road. Now, if I was only replacing one end, all you'd have to do is count the threads and screw the new one into match. That'll get you close enough to drive it. But since I'm replacing the entire thing, I'll go ahead and measure the overall length. This is why we dropped the entire steering linkage off in one piece. Now it's just a matter of assembling the new parts to match the old. Try to keep the adjustment sleeve centered between the two tie rod ends. This will give the most room for adjustment at the alignment shop. With the tie rods assembled, they can be attached to the center link. And don't forget the cotter pins. Duh! Last on is the idler arm. I'll cinch it down, pin it, and it's ready to get tucked up under the Buick's chin. We're upgrading the EBC brake rotors up front. They're slotted and drilled for better stopping power, and they're economical to fit into our budget. We're installing new bearings while we got everything apart, but they've got to be packed. You could use a bearing packer, but I'm going to show you guys how to do it the old-fashioned way. Time to grease your palm. With some bearing grease, that is. The process is really very simple. Just press the bearing cage into your palm until the grease squishes up through the top. Just make sure they're packed solid. The larger bearing goes on the back side of the rotor, followed by a new seal. Be careful not to deform it as you tap it in. A quick wipe with some grease and we're on to the front. Pack some more grease inside the rotor before dropping in the outer bearing. We replace the brake lines too, because it's pretty hard to tell if these things are bad just by looking at them, and always replace them in pairs. That way you don't end up with a weak link in the system. One more upgrade that will improve the overall performance of the brake system are these EBC brake pads. We're going to get these installed and button up the rest of the front end, but don't y'all go anywhere. we got a lot more Muscar coming up. Today on Muscle Car, we're spraying our way to budget beauty. Project Blue Collar is going to look good under the hood and sound sweet in the seat thanks to some low buck spray ons. And here are 455 fire up for the first time. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. The blue collar Buick here has turned into one of the most popular builds we've ever done on the show. And it doesn't even have an engine yet. But today we're gonna fix all that. There's just one small problem. There's a whole lot of ugly called an engine compartment that needs some serious attention. But the rest of this old century has come a long way. We dropped on a new lid, rebuilt a Buick 455 to give it some muscle, and put a shift kit in the 350 turbo. Then we gave it some smooth new door handles, lightened up the bumpers, designed some one-off taillights, and freshened up the suspension and brakes. You know, there's few things as disappointing as popping the hood on a nice ride and finding a big old mess of wires, shabby brackets, and rust. It's kind of like finally scoring a date with that hot chick and then finding out she's really a dude. We're not going to let that happen with our Buicks. So we're going to completely make over our engine compartment. Since this is a budget build, we got to do all we can to get the most bang for our buck. And this is one area where a little bit of cash can go a long ways. First step is to get rid of all the useless junk, starting with these small block Chevrolet mounts. Somebody worked awful hard to weld in these mounts using nothing more than a 12 volt battery and some wire hangers. At least that's what it looks like. But if that fresh 455 is going to find its new home, hey man, they got to go.
scrap metal out of the way, the rest of the smaller parts can be pulled to make it easier to clean for prep and paint. Be careful removing this stuff. Parts you may think are easily replaced could be harder to find than you think. Hey Rick, you ready to get, what the heck are you doing? Are you working out, man, <laughs> getting ready for the next step of the build. What? What are you talking about? This is gonna be the most important tool of the day. I call it my mini spray gun. Man, I smell what you're stepping in and I know how you like to paint. You need to get this car prepped out. All right. Duplicolor makes a great aerosol degreaser. Just make sure that whatever you use, it doesn't leave a residue or you could end up with peeling paint. We say we pull those hinges off. Go ahead. Be a little easier. I'm gonna drill alignment holes first though. I ain't messing around with that 500 pound hood trying to get it lined back up. For really stubborn grease, carb cleaner and a rag work great. Seam sealer, it gets old and brittle over time. And now is a good time to scrape out the old and prep for some new. So you know, Rick, yeah. there's not another person out there that I'd rather scrape seam sealer with. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. The red scotch bright will finish the prep and let the new paint bite in like a bulldog. Time for the new seam sealer. A brush, a glove, and a little love will make it look better than factory and help seal off future rust and corrosion. A finger dipped in lacquer thinner will smooth out the texture. When you're painting stuff like engine compartments, eventually you're gonna run across something that's kind of weird shaped, which means it's hard to mask off, but you don't wanna put paint on it. But it's also a pain in the butt to remove. Well, that's where tin foil comes in, or aluminum foil. Just tear off a piece, if I can get something torn off here, and wrap it around. Now for the fun part. Oh, Rick got his fingers warmed up earlier, so it's time for some paint. We went to the local parts store and put a big dent in their stock of rattle cans. A duple color comes in dozens of varieties and just about any color you could ever want. They also have specialty coatings for anything from undercoating to engine blocks. Now, engine compartments don't really require anything special, so I got some cool colors that I thought would look nice. Now, most of the engine compartment is gonna be a semi-gloss black for that OEM look. We'll use this gold here on the brake booster, and maybe some of the brackets just to throw in a little bit of detail. The textured metallic is for the evaporator housing, and I like the color of this engine enamel for the master cylinder and steering box. Now, everyone out there has probably used a rattle can at some time or another, so you know the drill. Shake the can for a minute or two, then commence to squirting. We're doing two full wet coats, waiting about 15 minutes for flash time in between. The smaller pieces, like the wiper motor and brake booster, still work fine, but to give them that like new appearance, they need some color too. They're both getting a light coat of etch primer first, then a layer of the final colors will go on. Looks good. Now I just got to hold it until it dries. <laughs> After standing around with these for like five minutes, they're finally dry enough to go back on the Buick. Well, I got a couple more holes to fill here, but don't go anywhere, because coming up after the break, Tommy's going to step in here and show you how to bench bleed a master cylinder. And later, a spray-on sound deadener that's easy to apply and easy on the wallet. Hey guys, welcome back. We've got the master cylinder off, so we're going to go ahead and replace it since it's only about 20 bucks. But before I can install it, I've got to bench bleed it because it's a whole lot easier to do it here than when it's on the car. The idea of bleeding is to remove the air from the system. Plugging the outlets will block one pathway and the air could get back in. 
filling the reservoir, then pressing the plunger will force the air back out of the cylinder and draw fresh brake fluid in. This will take several cycles, but once there's no more air bubbles coming up, you're good to go. Master cylinders come in raw iron, so to keep it looking good for more than 10 minutes, it's getting the duplicolor treatment like our other parts. One important thing to remember, brake fluid eats paint, so be really careful when reinstalling the brake line. Now the converter's got to go in before we can introduce the transmission to the engine for the first time. Now keep in mind here you got two sets of splines and as you put this on, both sets have to be engaged. So set it over the splines and put just a little bit of pressure on it as you rotate it and you'll feel it drop onto those splines. There's one. I may have already gotten the second one. But if you don't get that engaged all the way, then what happens, you put the engine against the transmission and it pushes that converter back against your pump and it'll break your pump. Then what you've got is a broken transmission before you even fire up your engine. One thing to check before mounting the transmission to the engine is the flywheel. Because if it's in the car, it's one of those kind of repairs that the parts are way cheap, but the labor will flat dab eat you alive. What to look for are stress cracks around the mounting holes or chipped teeth. You can see ours are missing quite a few, so we're going to go ahead and replace it. This adapter from Transtap will allow the Buick engine and the Chevy transmission to bolt together with no problem. This is an externally balanced flex plate, so it has to be clocked correctly. We paid attention when we took the old one off, so we can match it up now. Like most critical drivetrain parts, the flex plate needs to be torqued to spec. Last on is the adapter spacer. Hey, Tommy, heard you've been looking for a tranny. Not exactly, but let's put this on. <laughs> Our latest wrecking yard score is these factory big block motor mounts. With these, the 455 should bolt in just like it's been there its whole life. Okay, bring them back. Come on, whoop, whoop. We're in. Well, it looks great, but we want to hear this thing make some noise. And that means all the accessories need to go back on. Now keep in mind, all the hard parts are refurbished originals. Sweet. Hey man, you're topping that dude off like you think we're gonna fire it up. We need to get a cooling system installed first though. Man, I'm just putting it on there to see how it looks. And it looks pretty awesome. Yeah, it does. I got some bad news for you though. Oh yeah? Radiator hoses ain't gonna be here for a couple more hours, what? but I got some good news for you. What's that? The sound deadening stuff showed up. What's that, a muzzle for you? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> man, are you sure our budget's even got room for sound deadening? Oh yeah, Lizard's gonna send us one of their spray-in kits and it's actually cheaper than some of that tinfoil stick-on stuff. That's cool, a layer of that stuff on the floorboard would definitely cut down on some road noise. Yeah, well, I got the rust all treated and sealed up so we can get to spraying. All right. This stuff really is pretty easy to use. Start by stirring it up with a supplied mixing paddle. It's water soluble, so a bucket of water is all you need for cleanup. Pour it straight into the cup. No reducers or hardeners needed. That is some thick stuff. Lizard Skin Spray Gun Kit comes with a gun specifically designed for thicker materials. You want a plan of attack here so you don't end up spraying yourself into a corner. Start at the furthest point and you won't end up with it all over your knees and hose. You can put on a second coat, just make sure the first layer dries completely. And if you're wondering why I'm not wearing a mask, hey, this stuff is zero VOC, so no worries. And that, my friends, is it. Hey, welcome back. Those radiator hoses we were waiting on, I've just about got them installed. 
That means we're real close to firing up this 455. Yeah, we just about got this dude buttoned up, other than a few electrical connections and some fluids. Now, we haven't bolted up the converter to the flex plate yet, and that's because we don't have any coolant lines. No coolant lines means no fluid, and you don't want to fire this thing up, burn up your transmission. After that, all we need is a little bit of fuel, because right now, there's no gas tank in this thing. As you're adding the fluids, dump them in one at a time and check for leaks before moving on. It's a good idea to leave your battery cable loose for now, in case you see smoke and have to pull it off in a big hurry. With a temporary gas source hooked up to the pump, we can prime the carb and hit the key. Before we fire this dude up, you got a fire extinguisher? <laughs> Do the way you splash gas around? Yeah. Man, it's a big block. It's thirsty. Give it a shot. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Looks like all our prep work paid off, and it's running smooth enough that we can go straight to setting the timing and breaking in the cam. We're looking for 12 degrees before top dead center, and a little twist of the distributor nails it. That's it, right there. I'll kill it so you can cut it and tighten it up. Well, guys. It's like we have a successful rebuild on our hands. It runs good, it looks good, and it should make some pretty decent horsepower. Now we just have to get the carburetor dialed in, straighten out some vacuum lines. Yeah, but that's some stuff we gotta do when y'all aren't around, because we're all out of time. So until next week, y'all keep it between the ditches. You done over there yet? Yeah, I'm working on it. Good deal, good deal. Today on Muscle Car, Tommy flexes his fab skills and Rick gets artistic with his airbrush to create a one-off piece for the Buick and clean your tank without breaking the bank. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. Now, a lot of you Buick fans out there have written in to let us know how much you dig on watching blue collar Buick here come together. Let me let you in on a little secret. Before we picked up our 73 Century, we thought about building a whole different kind of Buick, a numbers matching GS. But considering how tight cash is these days, we thought a low buck build would be the way to go. And a GS just doesn't really fall into that kind of category. With a build budget of 10 grand, the 1500 we paid for this guy was right on target. We put a big chunk of cash into the Buick 455 then gave the Century some inexpensive upgrades and used old-fashioned ingenuity to come up with some money-saving ideas that'll set our Buick apart from the crowd. Now, even though our budget didn't allow for a true GS, we can incorporate one of the features that they use, a dual snorkel air cleaner. Yeah, those things were cool. They came on the late 60s and early 70s model GSs. They even offered it in 73, although it wasn't fresh air. Now, they may be cool, but man, they are not cheap. So what's our solution? You got it, we're going to build our own, and it's even going to be functional. No, we're not going to be knocking a couple holes in the hood, but we are going to be getting rid of something on the nose of this car that I have hated from day one, these fishbowl parking lights. Now, to keep those snorkels breathing, we're going to run ducts all the way up to the openings. Now, true, that means we're going to have to find a different place for the lights, but no worries. We'll show you plans for that another time. We're going to use a stock air cleaner base and graft in the intake tubes from these two we picked up at the junkyard. They were only about 10 bucks and they got the round ends we need to hook up to the air ducts. First up is to separate all the good stuff from the junk. The only part of the salvage yard air cleaners we're going to use is the snorkel. So the rest is going into the recycle bin. We won't be using the cold start actuator so they can go too. grinding the spot wells out from the inside so I can remove the extra metal, being careful not to damage the part we need. The snorkel on the stock air cleaner won't be used, so I'll add it to the cast off pile. Since the new snorkels will be in different spots, I'll be filling the hole the old one left behind. I'll get it ground down flush so I can weld the patch in later. With the base in place, I can clock and mark the new parts, making sure they're even and not causing any clearance problems. 
Before I attach the new inlets, I'll get this old hole plugged up. I'm using a hole saw to radius the ends of the new ports. This will duplicate the look of the stock air cleaner. The metal on these is pretty thin, so it's a good idea to dial your welder back some to keep from burning through. Hey man, check out my air cleaner. Yeah, that's looking smooth. Yeah, that's what I thought. I dig it. You got something figured out for our air inlet? Yeah, I kind of use a marker light here as a guide. I built a ring that'll set in there. And from there, I'm gonna use a chunk of three inch exhaust tubing, cut it off kind of short and weld it onto there, come off with a couple tabs, and that'll actually give us the same size to go right into it. inlets on your new air cleaner. Sounds like you got that cast rope, so I'm gonna go find me a cupcake. <laughs> Since I pre-made my template, I just need to transfer it to some 16-gauge steel and get it chopped out. If you don't have a bandsaw, don't sweat it. Just grab an airsaw or tin snips for this. With a piece this simple, a little hand forming will get the job done. Now once I got it pretty close, I'll throw a tack weld on it to keep it shape. Now here's where the three inch exhaust tubing comes in. A few more tacks and some shaping and I can burn it all together. Air intakes are just about done and they're looking pretty cool, but I still have to get them mounted. Well, I snuck over to Extreme, swiped a couple of these little tabs. I'm thinking they should be able to weld on there, get this thing mounted, we'll call it good. Ah, those will work perfect. I still need to connect my air inlets to the snorkels. To do that, I'll just use a basic piece of flexible hose. Now, the air cleaner may be the last thing to go on the engine before you shut the hood, but it's the first thing you see when you pop it open. So I'm going to take this dude off, clean it up, give him my personal touch. Coming up, find out how Rick turns this air cleaner into one hot item. And that looks pretty doggone good right there. Hey guys, now I know you might think the body work in an air cleaner is a little bit overkill, but don't forget, this stuff is 35 plus years old and it's been ground on, welded up, modified, and I sure as heck ain't going to put all my nice paint work on right over the top of it. So I'm going to treat these parts just like I would any other body panel. And that means smoothing out all the imperfections with body filler, sanding it down, getting some primer on it, giving it yet another sanding, and then spraying on the base coat. Yeah, this thing's looking pretty smooth here in just a solid color gray, and I wouldn't be embarrassed a bit to clear it and run it as is, but we got other plans. Masking is a critical part of painting graphics. The air cleaner will match the color scheme we have planned for the car. Charcoal and orange two-tone with the silver and red accent stripe. With the charcoal down as a base, the red stripe goes on next, so I'm masking off everything else. I mix up a dark red to complement the gray and orange and laid it down on the lid and base. Now once it dries, I'll cover the parts that'll stay red. The rest of this area will remain exposed and be shot with the silver. Now 
Next, I can remove the masking and cover up everything that won't be orange. You got a little sneak peek of this orange on the engine, and in keeping with our budget theme, it's nothing fancy. Just a DMD 617 toner straight out of the can. Topping it off with a mixture of two pearls will give this budget color a high dollar look. To save some time, I printed my graphics onto some transfer paper instead of hand drawing it. Next comes a time consuming process of cutting it out. <laughs> Unless you got a plotter, man, there's just no way around it. Now once it's all cut out, carefully peel off the stencil. Then it's finally time to play with some paint. The colors I'm using here are all custom mixes. Now I've got several different variations of red, orange, and yellow with some white highlights thrown in. Since these are the only flames on the car, I don't really want them to stand out too much. So to make them a little more subtle, I'm gonna darken them up as I go with some candy. With the majority of the design down, I can peel off the mask, then come back and freehand some highlights. Now a little bit of yellow candy tones down the white. Then I can unmask the whole thing and seal it all in with some clear. All right, time to see if all this hard work here is paid off. And that looks pretty doggone good right there. Hard to believe, we've only got like 60 bucks wrapped up in this whole setup. That's what a budget build is all about. Using your skills, not your wallet, to build something that you can really be proud of. The last piece of this puzzle is the ductwork. I'm hooking them up using a pair of couplers from Spectre. <laughs> I can't wait for someone to ask me to pop the hood on this thing. Hey, welcome back to the shop. You've seen us swap out stock gas tanks for new replacements or fancy fuel cells plenty of times. But with Project Blue Collar, there's really no reason why we can't use the original one. All we need to do is clean it up a bit. With the right product and a little bit of time and effort, you can restore your old gas tank and get decades more use out of it. We ordered this kit online, but your local parts store should be able to help you out too. This kit includes two types of cleaners and a sealer, all meant to work together for best results. We drained and dried the tank before we started, so the first thing to do is to remove the sanding unit. I'm using a brass drift to prevent sparks. I'm covering the hole up with duct tape to keep the chemical from sloshing out during the cleaning process. Prop the tank up and we're all ready to get to cleaning. Now for the chemicals. Make sure to wear protection because you don't want this stuff on your skin or in your eyes. Both of the first two chemicals are cleaners and the process for using them is about the same. Start by pouring the solution into the tank. Once it's in the tank, tape up the filler neck to prevent sloshing. Shake the tank around enough that the insides are totally coated, then let it sit for 20 minutes. Dumping it out can be a challenge. There's a baffle in the filler neck, so it's got to come out the sending unit hole. Get a helper and just shake until it's empty. We've got the tank cleaned and flushed and we're ready to apply the sealer, but we've got to get the tank dry first. You could use compressed air, but you're running a risk of burning up your compressor because you're going to use a whole lot of air. We're going to use a heat gun. Now, you don't have to have one of these. You could use a hair dryer, but it'll just take a little longer. This does take a while, so just keep checking and don't stop till it's bone dry. Now, with the tank all dry, we can move on to the last step, sealer. This stuff bonds to the inside of the tank, forming a liner that stops rust and seals up any pinholes and seams. Pour the sealer in straight from the can, then turn the tank to get an even layer on the inside. Let it set for a few minutes, then dump out the excess. The tank's all good to go on the inside, but what about the outside? We're not gonna install it looking like this. So for that brand new OEM look, we're using Eastwood's Tank Tone. Our tank is completely dry, but if your tank even has a little bit of gas in it, don't use a steel brush. It could cause a spark, and we all know sparks and gas don't mix. Use a brass or non-metallic brush to be safe. 
brake cleaner and a scotch brite will get the last of the grease off, and a wipe down with acetone will ensure a well prepped surface. I'm taping up the ground strap and the sending unit post for a professional look. All that's left now is to work the spray can. Well, that's one more piece of the Buick that we were able to save. It took some time and effort, but now we've got a tank that will look and perform like new for half the cash. Once this thing dries, I'm gonna throw it up under the car. But we're all out of time for this week, so until next week, y'all keep it between the ditches. Today on Muscle Car, blue collar Buick turns outrageous orange. Pick up some insider tips on blocking and paint prep and learn how to lay out a unique two-tone. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. The blue collar Buick here is going to be going through a major transformation today, and by the end of the show, you might not even recognize it. Yeah, you guessed it. It's finally time to lay down some color. It's amazing how a paint job can change the look of an entire car. Even with all the improvements we've made, the attitude adjustment isn't going to take true effect until we get a fresh coat of cool. There wasn't much cool to speak of when it arrived in its coat of pea green. But a big block 455 and new suspension has started to change all that. Some low buck touches like modern door handles, custom tail lights, engine compartment makeover, and an awesome air cleaner notched up the cool, but kept us on budget. And speaking of budget, now's a good time to see how much of ours we've already chewed through. Now remember the original concept for this build was to do the whole thing for under 10 grand. Now you and I both know how quick that can go away, so let's break it down, see how much we've used and how many fun tickets we still have left. Okay, we spent $1,500 on the car, $150 for the roof, and a total of $2,418 for the engine rebuild, trans adapter, and shift kit. At $1,436 for suspension and brakes, cosmetic items like door handles, tail lights, air cleaner, and spray paints came to $356, and miscellaneous parts were $265. That's a grand total of only $6,125, and leaves us with $3,875 for paint and body, wheels and tires, and interior, so we're right on track. A good way to keep costs down is to do as much of the work as possible yourself. Like blocking, if you had to pay someone to do this, it would cost you an arm and a leg. But do it yourself, all it costs you is some sandpaper and some time. And blocking out a car is one of the most critical steps in a quality paint job. Concave surfaces like this can really mess with you, so make sure that you use a block that matches the contour of your surface that you're sanding on. Otherwise, you're just gonna start sanding a bunch of lines into it. Also, make sure when you're sanding, don't sand straight up and down like this because you'll do the same thing. Just like it's starting to do there, that quick, you'll start cutting grooves into your surface. You're a pain in the butt to sand back out. Move it across and keep your block at an angle. Give you a nice, clean surface to paint on. And as you're sanding like this, don't forget, you also need to cross your pattern. That way you can blend it all together. And one last thing, don't run over the top of your body lines because by leaving that guide coat right along that edge, it's gonna tell you if your body lines are still straight. Save that for the very last thing. While blocking, it's almost guaranteed that you're gonna run across some nicks or chips kinda like these. Now you could sand this thing out, but you're running a risk of actually digging the panel out, creating a dip or a wave, which you'll see once you throw on a bunch of shiny. Me, I usually choose to go ahead and fix it with a razor blade. I like using a razor blade because it applies the perfect amount. Now once this dries, it takes almost no effort to sand off the excess. Then you can move on, which makes you a whole lot more efficient. Now here's a perfect example of why you use guide coat. It shows you where all your low spots are. Apparently, we have a little bit of an unwanted body line there. The other thing is when you're sanding, always bring it down to the body line, especially in an area like this, because we basically reshaped the whole bottom lip of this trunk lid. So that means we had to build a new body line. So just keep blocking it, but leave that edge, and that'll tell you when your body lines are straight. When block sanding, I like to do it in two steps. First would be the coarse cut, which is 80 to 120, and then follow that with a finer grit at 180 to 220, 
What this does is cuts down your sand and scratches to help prevent shrinkage. What is shrinkage? Shrinkage is whenever your primer starts to dry out. Now, if this starts to happen whenever you've got paint on it, man, it just looks horrible. Now, I'll put some guide coat on it to help it show up better. So spend some time and sand it finer. Trust me, it's worth it. It's just cheap insurance. Another really important aspect of blocking out a car is knowing when to stop. And here's a perfect example of that. We've got metal showing here, filler, guide coat, and we still have a low spot running across our body line. That indicates we may have gotten a little bit fast in finishing out our body work and getting ready for prime. But at this point, continuing blocking on this, all it's going to do is make it worse and waste your time because you're going to have to go back over it. So at this point, stop, finish the body work, and get it ready for a reprime. Another tip on sanding is use the longest block you can on the panel for a couple of reasons. The longer the block, the easier it is to sand that panel flat. Second, that's more surface area, allowing you to sand it faster. We've still got a lot of sanding to do and got a hose on some final primer. So y'all stick around after the break and we'll give you some tips on final sanding. Coming up, Rick reveals his secrets to laying out the perfect two-tone. Hey guys, welcome back. We've got a final coat of primer on blue collar Buick here and got all the guide coat laid down. I've heard a lot of guys ask, well, why can't you just use black spray paint as guide coat? Well, there's a good reason for that. True guide coat is actually a sprayable form of carbon, where a spray paint, what's well, going to jam up your paper as you're sanding and cause you more problems. Now, it's no denying that sanding a car is hard work, so you're probably going to end up breaking a sweat. So you don't want to be dripping all your goo all over the car because this can cause contamination, which leads to fish eyes and can be a bear in the booth when you try to fix it. So just be cautious of this while you're sitting in the car to keep all that from happening. There's two basic techniques when you're blocking out a car. There's either wet sanding or dry sanding. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. One of the big disadvantages of wet sanding is the fact that by the time you're done, you are going to have a whole bunch of sludge you're going to have to go back and clean up. But on the bright side, it kind of cleans the surface as you go. You can squeegee it off and see where you're at. Now, dry sanding, I don't think it gives you quite as smooth of a surface, but on the bright side, it's a lot easier to simply go over it and blow it off and clean it back up. But my preferred method, obviously, is wet sanding. So I'm going to get this dude cleaned up. We'll see you guys in the booth. A clean surface is critical to a good paint job. So after all that sanding, we blew it out real well, masked it off, and then wiped it down with some paint prep. Now she's ready for some color. Now, if you don't remember our plans for the paint scheme, let me refresh your memory. Now, we have made a few changes since this rendering was done. Namely, we're going to add a silver stripe inside of this red that breaks the charcoal from the orange. Now, when you're dealing with multiple colors like this, you need to plan ahead. So I'm going to be laying down the red first because that color is going to dictate where all the other colors end up. Now, even though the red stripes are only going to be an eighth of an inch wide, I'm laying down a pretty wide stripe to give myself plenty of wiggle room when I lay out the design. The quickest and most accurate way to lay out long stripes is to pull the longest lines that you can. This helps keep your stripes from looking wavy. This half inch tape is going down as a guide to keep the graphic straight and consistent. Once the upper red stripe is laid out, the guide tape can go. Next, I can lay down silver in the center of the stripe. After about 20 minutes of flash time, it's time to cover it all up. To prevent the orange from bleeding into the graphic, I'm covering the entire stripe, then coming back and trimming it to expose the outside edge of where the final colors will meet. This in-your-face orange is far from custom. It's just straight PPG DMD 617 toner. But to make this basic toner look custom, I'm topping it off with a mixture of orange and gold pearl. I'm fogging in some candy tangerine on the rockers. This will give a subtle fade to the lower half of the car. 
And once it's dry, I can mask off for the final color. And when you're doing any kind of two-tone, it's really important to seal up all the gaps between panels where color is going to travel inside the car and come out where you really don't expect it. The last color is a metallic charcoal called Dark Smoke Poly, also known as GM code number 14. It'll take three coats to cover and a dust coat to even out the metallic. Hey guys, welcome back. We're down to my favorite part of a paint job, and that's where you get to unmask it, see how it's gonna look. All right, guys, now normally the next thing that we'd show you here is the clear coat going on, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret, kind of a behind the scenes sort of a thing. I know a lot of you guys think that we somehow work out of some swirling vortex of perfection here, but it's just not true. We get problems just like everybody else, and I'm going to show you a little secret here. Before you put down the clear coat, it's a good idea to go over the whole thing with some DX330 and look for spots just like this. Now these are actually marks that are left by the tape and the base coat. Now they look pretty bad without the clear coat on them, but the 330 will show you that with the clear on it, they'll turn invisible, so it's nothing to worry about. This right here though, that's a whole nother story because paint will bleed underneath your tape, and that's gotta be fixed. Now for spots in the pinstripe, like that red, I usually use a good old-fashioned striping brush, but if you don't have one of these, you can always go back, remask it, and spot it in with a gun. But I've just found this is a whole lot faster, and for me, a lot easier. As that dries, it'll darken up, and you won't even see it. That's about all there is to it. I'm gonna go around this car here, clean up a few edges, and then be ready to clear it. I'm using PPG 2021 clear. Now we could have used cheaper materials, but I've sprayed a lot of this 2021. And trust me, it's worth the extra few dollars. It has excellent UV protection and polishes out like glass. And for all you haters out there that swore that the Buick would never be cool, Check this out, and all the materials for the paint ran 1150 bucks. Tire Rack hooked us up with a set of 20 inch wheels with tires for only 1500. That may seem like a big chunk of our tiny budget, but hey, it's gonna make up a big chunk of the overall look. And that leaves us over 1200 bucks to do the interior and still keep our budget under 10 grand. I think we can still do it because I've got some money saving plans for the interior. Yeah, I got some ideas too, but that's gonna have to wait till next week because for this week, we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here. Today on Muscle Car, don't trash that old dash, learn to fix it without a lot of cash. Ugly interior, we'll show you how to dye it, repair it, or fab it for a fresh new look. Ride along as Project Blue Collar hits the town. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. We're down to the final stages of the build of Blue Collar Buick. All we need is some glass, interior, and some sweet sounding exhaust. 
And we're going to knock all that out today so we can take our ugly duckling turned cool Buick out on the streets, see how many heads we can turn. It's amazing how far the 73 century has come. We revived an old Buick 455 for the power plant and installed a shift kit in the 350 turbo. Our low bug body mods like modifying the bumpers, updating the door handles, and hand fabbing the taillights gave it an all new attitude. Topped off with a slick two-tone paint job and some 20 inch wheels, and we've got one sick street cruiser. Even after that, we've got 1,200 left of our 10 grand budget. Most of the cash will be spent on the interior. We need to dye the seats and door panels, throw in a headliner and carpet, add in a floor shifter and console, paint the steering column, and put in a new steering wheel. The dash needs a little extra work, so I went ahead and removed it. Let me show you what I've got planned for that. This thing obviously could use a coat of color, but also I'm going to have to deal with this big crack, which is a common problem. No one repops these, and a used one would probably have the same issues, so I'm just going to do a little plastic repair and fix this one. A big hump is formed where the sun has baked the plastic, so I'll need to get it leveled off. And I've never liked these perforated built-in speaker grills, so since the crack runs right through it, it's getting filled in. I'll also be the edges of the crack to give the adhesive plenty of surface area to grip. Some masking tape will act as a form for the glue until it dries. This is a two-part plastic repair adhesive and has to be mixed really well before it's applied. Make sure you mash it in all the holes and don't lay it on too thin or the repair won't last. Once it sets up, a quick hit with a rotary grinder will prep it for the glaze coat. This glaze is a flexible filler and won't crack like regular body filler would. But you do have to sand it just like any other filler, and once it's smooth, it's ready for sealer and paint. While Tom has been working on the dash, I got a wrecking yard bucket seat set in place, and they fit pretty good. They're out of a 1974 Cutlass, and they're in pretty good shape, so all we have to do, clean them up and dye them. Hey man, I gotta wait for that dash to dry, so I'm gonna go ahead and take these off your hands. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, would you find the rear seats and get them cleaned up for me? Sure, I can do that. Thanks, brother. The best way to prep your seats is to take them all the way apart. It's worth the effort, cause your dye job will look better and last longer. Then you can hit it with some dish soap. One thing to watch for as you're cleaning and prepping your seats is to see if the water beads up. If it does, that's some form of oil, wax, or conditioner that must be removed for the dye to adhere properly. And make sure to rinse them off with clean water once they're done. Rick got the back seat all cleaned up, but there's one small little problem. A couple of the seams are busted. No big deal. I'll just stitch them up and it'll be ready for a new coat of color. I've got to get to the back side of the vinyl, so I need to do a little disassembly. With material this old, you've got to be really careful not to cause more damage. Once the backing is opened up, I can grab my poster needle and heavy duty thread and go to town. Bet my grandmother be proud. Let's see what we got. Yeah, that doesn't look bad at all, especially for somebody who doesn't operate a sewing needle a whole lot. This thing's ready for some color now. I'm using a professional vinyl dye. It's easy to apply and gives an original looking finish. In fact, most people won't be able to tell these parts didn't come this color. While Tommy gets another coat of color laid down on the seats, I'm going to get the console and shifter installed. They came out of the same vehicle as our front buckets did, a 1974 Cutlass. Now they're pretty similar vehicles, so hopefully this stuff will go in without causing me too much hassle. Now first I'm going to see if I'm lucky enough to have pre-existing mounting points. Now, I must have been good somewhere because the holes are already factory stamped. All I have to do is cut a shifter hole and run in some self-tapping screws as markers. Now next I need to set the carpet in place to cut the access holes. Now I know the color looks a little reddish on camera, but trust me, it's black. The studio lights are just playing some tricks with us here.
Now I can take the marker screws back out, mount the shifter, and check the fit of the console and trim. That went in easier than I thought. Think I'll pull this thing back out, sneak it into the pile of parts that Tommy's getting ready to die. I bet he won't even notice. Coming up, Rick shows you how easy it is to keep the bugs out of your teeth. Hey, welcome back. I've got most of the interior parts painted, including the dash, pillar post, and console. I've decided to two-tone the door panels because they've got this factory trimmed out area. The front ones are all done, the rears mask up, and they're ready for the gray. When you're dyeing an interior, you can be as creative as you want. I'm doing a two-tone instead of one solid color. But if you feel like masking a lot, you could take it even further with different color inserts, stripes, and accents. Sweet, that looks pretty good. Now all we lack is a couple pieces on the inside and we'll be ready to throw all these pieces in it. There's not a whole lot in here I need to hit with the spray can, the lower dash, the steering column, and a trim panel at the speaker deck. Rick's already got it all prepped out for me, so all I gotta do is tape it up. While the dash dries, I can get the rear speaker panel covered. A local upholstery shop sold us some vinyl and upholstery board. I cut it to fit, and a can of glue is going to hold it all together. Upholstery board is a thick cardboard. It's textured on one side, so you don't have to cover it. But to get a cleaner look, it can be wrapped like I'm doing here. Upholstery glue is really easy to use. Just spray it on both sides, give it a few minutes to set, and stick the pieces together. Make sure there's no wrinkles or bubbles before you let it dry. When you're wrapping the edges, make some relief cuts so it won't bunch up in the corners. We could have bought some black vinyl, but to make sure the color will match with the rest of the panels, I'm just gonna spray it with the same dye. After some dry time, we can install all the parts we've revived. The controls, gauges, radio, and vents are all original parts we just cleaned up, and they don't look bad at all. There was no help for the old steering wheel, so we caught up Summit Racing for one to match the new color scheme. To complete the interior, the original back seats can drop in and the recycled buckets can find their new home. Like most of the parts that we've put on today, the glass is original to the car. It's in pretty good shape, so all we did is clean the stuff up and we'll go ahead and reinstall it. Our only real money that we had to spend was on some clips, a little bit of urethane. I cleaned the glass first with some heavy duty cleaner and 4 aught steel wool, so now I can apply the urethane primer around the inside edge. That stuff is actually doing two different things here. It's going to help the urethane stick, but beyond that, it covers up all the little bubbles along the edge. And don't forget to apply some to the window channel, too. Next come the clips. There's a lot of different styles, but they all basically install the same way. Slide them over the tab and lock them into place. This car originally used a butyl rope seal, but urethane is a safer alternative. A simple caulk gun and strong forearm are all that's needed. Cutting the tip in a V will give me a taller bead than a straight cut would. The glass needs to drop in immediately before the urethane starts to skin over, so don't wait around. Get it as close as you can before you drop it into place. What I'm doing here is just kind of working some of this urethane back in. I like to do it just because I hate it when you get this thing all done, put together. You wash the car for the first time, and you see that little trickle of water going down the inside of your windshield. 
this right here will help prevent that from happening. In keeping with the no chrome look, we blacked out all the trim. There we go. With all the trim installed, there's just one thing left, the exhaust. These cherry bombs are budget friendly and they sound great. So I'm gonna go ahead and hang some pipe under the Buick, but stick around, because later on in the show, we're gonna be taking Blue Collar out for a maiden voyage. We started out with 10 grand burning a hole in our pocket, and that bought us the 73 Buick Century, plus a few upgrades. Between paint, parts, and power, we slid in just under budget. Some cars are built to burn up the track or carve through the back roads, but this one's more about going slow, low, and being seen. <laughs> topped off the tank and pointed it towards the tallest buildings we could find. It cruised the freeway like a champ, but when we hit the streets of downtown, it felt right at home. With this 455, stoplight action would be no problem, but that wouldn't give people time to stare. Clouds over the city are nice, but now that the motor's broken in, we're headed to our secret back road to make a few clouds of our own. You know, these old Buicks ain't really known for the horsepower, but they're known for their torque. <laughs> You know, Rick, this thing definitely belongs on the road. Well, I know guys have to spend a whole lot more to get a whole lot less, that's for sure. Hey man, after riding around all day, I'm about ready to grab a bite and maybe something cold to drink. You cool yeah, with that? No joke, me too, buddy. Hey, for this week, we're out of time, so until next time, we're out of here. Today on Muscle Car, Blue Collar Buick is back for some performance upgrades. Rick swaps out the Turbo 350 for a 700R Overdrive Trans, and Tommy shows how to measure for custom push rods. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. Blue Collar Buick here has been a huge success, and we've taken a big born beast and turned it into a cool cruiser slash daily driver, and we did it all for under 10 grand and most of you guys really seem to dig it. But we also caught a lot of flack from some Buick fans. The buzz on V8Buick.com says we're not doing justice to the 455, so we're gonna take that as a challenge and turn old blue collar from a cruiser to a bruiser. With a hotter cam, better heads and intake, bigger carburetor and headers, we're expecting a 35 to 40% increase in horsepower. But before we do anything, we need to get a baseline. So we're making a long trip down the hall to the horsepower shop and strapping blue collar down to the chassis dyno to see what we've got. We know there's hidden power and tuning, but since upgrades are on their way, we're going to hold off until the new parts are installed. Under 94 horsepower, 271 foot-pounds of torque. I think there's some room for some improvement, though. <laughs> there's a lot of room. Well, you can see the, the curves, the horsepower and torque curves. We just never tuned it. Right. We built it, bolted it on, and ran it. We haven't touched it. Now, I'll be honest with you. It hurts just a little bit tearing apart this engine that was running so well. But a lot of these parts are going to be reused. And in the end, it'll definitely be worth the pain. Well, it looks like our Buick is running pretty good. Nice and white and clean, but it's gonna be even better. I wonder why Buick made that hole on top of that manifold bolt. To save weight. That's the only thing I can guess. Unless it's in the manufacturing process of some sort of stamping it out. It was during the war. 
They were trying to conserve steel. I smell fertilizer. <laughs> I'd like to know one. Now we know that you really wouldn't use a cherry picker to pull an intake, but we're trying to make a point here. You got it? Yeah, she's up there. <laughs> These suckers are heavy. Okay, whose idea was it to use a cherry picker? <laughs> okay, you got it? Yeah, I got this. Okay. Okay, Careful. come back. Careful. Come back. Careful. Careful. Well, you're looking at 80 pounds of cast iron here. Thanks, Buick. One hand after this one. Let's get this hand off. Holy dirt. Now, when we originally built this engine, we had a pretty strict budget in mind. So we used a camshaft that would give us a few extra ponies, but didn't require us to upgrade any of the valve train. This new one from Crane Cams has more lift and duration, so it's going to give us more power and torque, as well as a broader power band. Plus, the idle is going to be far from stock. Sure, we could have gone with an even hotter cam, but that requires bigger heads, more compression, a higher stall, and shorter gears. But all of these affect drivability, and we want to keep blue collar street friendly. After setting the number one cylinder to top dead center, the old timing set and cover can go back on. Sometimes headers need to be set in place along with the engine. Since we didn't pull the engine, we need to make sure they're going to fit once the heads are on. Step one is getting the stock manifolds out of the way. Yeah, dude, those drop right in. We put them in now, though, it's gonna be harder to do the transmission. Yeah, let's just leave them off and finish the top end. Yeah, stick the heads on. Yeah. Now, these old Buick heads, well, they're not just heavy. These are the lowest compression, least desirable heads that Buick has ever built. So swapping them out is a no-brainer. The Edelbrock heads, well, they're half the weight. Plus, they have bigger valves, smaller combustion chambers, and a better designed rocker arm assembly. And that makes for a whole lot more power and better reliability. We've already installed the gaskets that came in our Edelbrock gasket set, so the heads are ready to go on. Some Loctite thread sealant will not only keep the bolts in place, it'll lubricate the threads for more accurate torque reading. After running them down with an impact, we'll torque them to spec in three or four stages, then drop the lifters in. The stock push rods won't work with these heads. Edelbrock tells us the required length using these heads with an undecked block. But if your block's been decked or your heads have been milled, it's going to require measuring for some custom push rods. Push rods move the rocker back and forth over the valve tip. If the push rod is too long, it will push the roller off the outer edge. Too short, and it will slip off the inside edge. The idea is for the rocker to stay in the center 80% of the valve tip surface. The most accurate way to gauge what length you need is with a push rod measuring tool. There's a couple different types, but the one that I like to use comes in a calibrated length and doesn't require any other tools. Make sure the lifter is at base or the lowest point. Drop the tool into the lifter, making sure it's seated, and place a rocker on the stud. Adjust the tool by twisting the two halves apart until the roller is at the correct point on the inner edge of the valve stem. Put on a rocker nut and tighten to zero lash, then turn an additional three-quarter turn for lifter preload. Turn the crank until the lifter is at its highest point, and check for roller placement on the outer edge of the valve stem. If it's not right, repeat the process until the lowest and highest points are correct. Then simply remove the push rod and count how many turns you've made. The preset length of this tool is 8.8 .8 inches, and each full turn adds 50 thousandths. We twisted it 17 turns, making our total length 9.650. This matches what Edelbrock told us we should order for our unmodified block and heads. We ordered a set from Crane along with a cam and rockers, so we can go ahead and install them. The rockers go on just like we showed you earlier, making sure each lifter is at base. Tightening the rocker nut to zero lash, then going another three quarters turn. Edelbrock Performer intakes boost torque and give quicker throttle response. Plus, they're 50 pounds lighter than stock, 
and with their gaskets, no valley pan is required. With aluminum parts, it's important to use anti-seize on the bolts to prevent stripping and use the recommended torque sequence. An Edelbrock 800 CFN carb will run as smooth as factory and help boost horsepower. There's nothing wrong with the stock water pump, alternator, pulleys, and fan, so all these parts are going back on as is. While I finish all this stuff up, Rick's going to get our ignition upgrades ready to install. Our 455 is building more power and turning higher RPMs, and we want to make sure that the ignition is up to the task. Because if you're not getting the spark to the cylinders, then all these upgrades aren't going to do you a bit of good. Now, we already have an electronic ignition, but we can improve on it with Summit's HEI upgrade kit. It includes a hotter coil for a stronger spark, and the cap itself is higher quality with a better casting and contacts for a longer life. The module is more precise to handle those higher RPMs, and the kit comes with different weights and springs so you can adjust the timing curve. And to make sure that that hotter spark gets to the plugs, you need a better set of wires. MSD's universal 8.5 set, well these will handle anything that we're going to throw at them. Be sure the motor is at top dead center and drop the distributor in with the rotor in the correct position. With the motor buttoned up, we can install our aluminum radiator from Summit Racing. Hey guys, welcome back. When we first put the drivetrain in this thing, we kept the original Turbo 350 just to keep costs down. But I've got my doubts whether or not this 35-year-old transmission here is going to hold up to all the extra power we're going to be getting out of this 455. So as long as we got to freshen something up, we might as well upgrade. The 700R4 has a shorter first gear and an overdrive, so that means you can run a shorter rear gear for those stoplight battles, but still have the high-speed cruising capabilities of the overdrive. A TCI Super Street Fighter transmission is one step away from a full-on competition unit. All the internals have been upgraded to handle up to 600 horse, so that means we don't have to worry about twisting the guts out of that dude. When you're upgrading your drivetrain, make sure the converter is matched to your rear end gears and your engine specs. So too low of a stall and your motor could die at idle. Too high of a stall and it'll rev right past its power band before your car even starts to move. Now, if you're not sure which one to get, call your supplier. They'll hook you up with the right one. All right, guys, I know we've gone over this before, but it's important and it bears repeating. When you put a converter on, make sure that you get it lined up with both sets of splines and the two tabs on the front of your pump are lined up with the two slots in the converter. If you don't get all of that lined up, then when you cinch it up against your engine, it'll put pressure on the front pump and crack it. So it should drop in twice. There's one, and there's two. Once it's all the way in, then you're good to go. Once the housing is bolted up, connect the coolant lines and TV cable, not to be confused with a kick down cable. The TV cable controls the internal fluid pressure and must be adjusted correctly. Now when you're switching from a Turbo 350 to a 700, you're going to run into a few snags, but buddy, that's just part of hot rodding. One of the problems is that a 700 is a few inches longer than a 350. It's not that big of a deal. This one in particular, though, the mount was a little bit lower than the factory 350. So what I'm doing is sliding the cross member back. I'm going to extend a plate out forward to bolt it into. This is a pretty basic piece, but a template will still help with the design. Eighth inch plate is plenty strong enough for this task and can be easily cut with a bandsaw or a plasma cutter. I'll tack it in place in the car, then remove the whole cross member to finish welding. While Rick's finishing his piece, I'll shorten the exhaust to make room for the headers. So line that up. It should drop right in. Easy as pie. Now, obviously, we're going to have to shorten up the drive shaft also, but we'll do that when we do the rear end. So for now, it's on to the headers. This engine's gonna be pumping out a lot more air than it did from the factory. And those stock manifolds, well, they're just gonna choke it down. A lot like breathing through a straw. These Hooker Super Comp long tube headers from Summit Racing, they're gonna give us the airflow it needs. They have thicker flanges for a better seal and heavier tubing gives longer life and controls heat. Well guys, we took some big steps today in turning our big block Buick into a real street pounder by upgrading the entire top end headers, transmission, and a whole lot more. If you have any questions about anything we use today, you can check it out at PowerBlockTV.com. 
to handle all that extra power, it could really use a beefed up rear axle and some better brakes. And then we can throw it on the dyno and see how bad our Buick can really be. But we're all out of time for this week. So until next week, y'all keep it between the ditches. Today on Muscle Car, Blue Collar Buick gets a rear end swap and disc brake conversion to go with its beefed up 455. Check out the post upgrade dyno numbers and see how a hood tack is installed. Then Tommy shows off the Buick at the GS Nationals. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. We love a challenge around here, and when you Buick guys out there threw down the gauntlet and suggested we was wasting this 455 with our original budget build, well, we decided to kick it up a notch. Last time, we upgraded this dude to stage one performance with a more aggressive cam, better heads intake and ignition, a bigger carb, long tube headers, and a new tranny. Now, it's always nice to have some numbers to brag about, so coming up later in the show, we got a date with the dyno. But first, we got a few more upgrades to do. We're expecting a whole lot more torque out of that motor. So rear end upgrade, well, that's a given. Then we're going to be swapping out these rear drums for new discs. Now, technically, there's nothing wrong with this eight and a half, but it's a one-legger, and that means all the power goes to one wheel, while the other wheel just sits there looking dumb. By adding a posi unit, we're going to send the same amount of power to each of the two wheels. That'll make for better traction and better acceleration. And while we're in there, we're going to throw in a set of shorter gears because that'll help get the engine into its power band a lot quicker. Now here's something interesting about this rear end. It doesn't have C-clips on the axles. They are actually bolt-in. Now, not a lot of guys know about them, but GM did make them. Bolt-in axles are better for performance applications because if an axle breaks, the wheel will stay attached to the car. With C-clips, the broken axle with the wheel and tire attached can exit the housing and turn your day at the drag strip into a real drag. A pry bar stuck between the ring and pinion gears will jam them up so you can get the pinion nut loose. The caps come off next. They need to go back on the same side they came off of, so make sure not to mix them up. A little gentle persuasion and the stock open diff will pop right out. Knock the pinion in to get the yoke off, and the rest of the assembly will slide out. If you're looking to buy a used rear end out of a wrecking yard and maybe out of a swap meet, and you want to double check what gears are in that rear end before you lay down your cash, it's pretty simple. Just pop the rear diff cover off and look for the number stamped in the ring gear. Look for the last sequence of numbers in here and then divide the second number into the first number. In this case, it'd be 15 into 41, so we know that this is a 273 gear set. Now, the lower the number, the taller the gear ratio, and that can mean a lot slower acceleration. Now, these gears combined with an overdrive transmission, they'd be way too tall. So we're going to swap out to a set of 373s. Now, these will give us better acceleration, but combined with the overdrive transmission, we can still cruise down the freeway at a decent RPM. But before we can put anything back in the housing, I need to do some pre-assembly. The press will get the new bearings installed on the pinion and locker, but you can also carry them down to your local machine shop, and they can take care of them in a jiffy. pretty easy, but the races are pressed in and require a little more convincing. If your housing is out of the car, the best way to install a new race is with a press, but since ours is still bolted in the car, a hammer and brass punch will do the job. Just be careful not to damage or distort the race in any way. With the new bearing set and a seal in place, the pinion, crush leave, and yoke are up next.
Next, Blue Collar's got a lot more go power. Now, Rick's going to give it some whoa power. And later, the event of the year for Buick fans. Hey guys, welcome back. When you're doing performance upgrades on a vehicle, bolting on all those high performance, go fast goodies is the fun part. But don't forget, stopping is pretty important too. Now, drum brakes are prone to fading and overheating, adding bigger wheels and tires and more speed, and the problem's just gonna get worse. Now, disc brakes run cooler and they're a lot more efficient, so they can handle the pressure bringing that nearly two ton beast to a halt. Now, Summit Racing sent us this conversion kit for a GM 10 bolt, but they're available for just about anything. Drum brakes aren't horrible, and they've safely stopped vehicles for over a century. But the fact is, disc brakes are simpler, lighter, and safer. The only thing we're reusing here is the e-brake cable. Everything else is out of here. The flex line and all the fittings came in Summit's brake kit, which means you don't have to shop around for odds and ends to finish your install. And that's about it. Now we don't have to worry about scrubbing off any excess speed. Now we just have to bleed these out, install a shortened drive shaft, then it's back to the dyno to see if this big block lives up to the name, Buick. Coming up, hood tacks aren't just for Pontiacs. Find out how easy it is to install one in your ride. Then Blue Collar takes a trip to Buick Heaven. Before we started our upgrades, we made a baseline dyno run so we'd have some before numbers for comparison. 194 horsepower, 271 foot pounds of torque. From the minute we fired her up, we could tell she had a deeper growl but we're after more than just sound. The dyno numbers are gonna tell us if we've reached our goal of a 40% horsepower increase. Picked up a few, 290. Torque picked up to 352. Your peak's right at five grand, and it starts to roll off. That's a good gain. That is almost 100 horsepower difference, dude. 50% gain. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's not bad. Now that we got some respectable power under the hood, it's gonna be kinda hard to keep my foot off the gas. So to make sure I don't overdo it, we're gonna add a hood tack. All right, now I know what you guys are thinking. Hood tacks are for Pontiacs. Well, it's true that they were more common on the GTOs and the Firebirds. You could special order them on the Buick GSs. And they were basically the same thing, just with the faces changed a little bit. Now this kind of creative part swapping was pretty common with GM back then. And we're gonna do the same thing. Now they do make Buick hood tacks, but the 5200 red line on this Pontiac model, well it's pretty much dead on to where we need it to be. And we took a cue from GM and just modified the face to fit our project. Pretty cool, huh? All right, dude, these things weren't exactly available in 73, so we can put it wherever we want. Well, I was looking over here at the underside of the hood. Right here, it wouldn't interfere with all the bracing and all. Yeah, I don't drop the hood real quick. Give or take about there. Yeah, that don't look bad up here. Looks like it should work, right? That's perfect, because it's not in your line of sight to see the road either. Good deal. 
first, I'll mark the bottom side to make sure we'll clear all the braces. After drilling the pilot hole, the hole saw comes out. You can actually smell the fresh paint as it chews its way through. Poor Rick had to leave the room while I did this. But you gotta break some eggs to make an omelet. And this one's looking pretty good. A paper template will help mark where the mounting holes need to be drilled. Step drill bits are designed for drilling through sheet metal and ensure a perfectly round hole. After smoothing off the rough edges, I'll mask up the hole and shoot on some Duplicolor Etch Primer and Semi-Gloss Black. One problem with the first hood tax was moisture getting into the housing and fogging up the lens. Modern Repops, they're sealed up, but if you're restoring an original, you can use the same fix as the 69 Up models did. It's as easy as running a tube from the heater box to the housing, and that's why I drilled that extra hole. Since ours is a modern version, we don't need to do this, but we wanted to show you guys just how easy it is. After screwing in a hose barb, the tag can be dropped into place. Rubber vacuum line works fine for the feed. Run it through any available hole in the firewall and pull the excess through to the inside. Drill a hole in the heater box, being careful not to rupture the heater core, flaps, or anything else important. A 90 degree hose barb completes the defrost option on our tack. All that's left now is the wiring. It's just a few simple connections that run from the pigtail to the ground, distributor, and fuse block. As usual, painless wiring lives up to their name. With the right connectors on hand, extending the wiring really is painless. HEI distributors all have a TAC terminal, making this part of the install a breeze. To make the light functional, just tap into a switch tot on the fuse block. With all the connections completed, I can cinch it down and test it out. That is cool. Now she's ready to roll. Want to take it out for a quick road test? Man, I was thinking more like a road trip. You game? I can't, brother. I have to go pick up her next project. Gonna have to go on without me. Well, I try to keep it on two wheels most of the time. <laughs> we'll see you bye. <laughs> All right, man. After the break, take a trip to the ultimate Buick event. Collar is running like a champ, so I pointed her toward Bowling Green, Kentucky, where the Buick GS Nationals are in full swing. This is the place to go if you have a Buick or if you just love looking at them. Man, there's some nice looking Buicks here. There's guys and gals from all over the country here. See how many people are here? Showing off their Buick pride. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you watching. Why did I choose Buick? Happened to see a full set of taillights go past. It was a 1965 GS. When I said, when I get out of the service, I'm going to have a GS. We all do our cars just to make them, you know, what we want. It's a lot of fun. Buicks in every style, color, and era are on display here, plus some unexpected surprises. It's a turbocharged Cadillac. Got the Grand National uh, motor in it. And speaking of Grand Nationals, these turbo V6 muscle cars that took the 80s by storm are here in force. I'm feeling like a kid in a candy shop with all these Buick beauties on display. But there's one that's caught my eye. Hmm, this one seems kind of familiar. Old Blue Collar is definitely at home here. It's a beautiful paint job. That's a beautiful paint job. Oh, it's a beauty. Boy, that is just beautiful. Oh, I like the wheels. The wheels are sharp. This crowd really seems to like what we've done to our 73 century. But this event's about more than just looking good. It's about going fast. The drag strip is calling these guys' names. You're not going to see any Mustangs or Camaros on this track. It's all Buick power today. This is a perfect chance to put our new performance upgrades to the test. Let's see what this girl will do. Thirteen point.
2.8. Not bad for a two-ton car with no hook. Old Blue Collar's done everything we've asked her to do and more. She may not be everybody's idea of a muscle car, but we hope it's inspired you to think outside of the box and redefine what a muscle car can be. I want to thank the GS Club of America for putting on a great show. I'm headed back to the track for one more run, so until next week, y'all keep it between the ditches.